Good evening, everyone. Um, I just wanted to know if I could change my name. It, uh, the spelling of my name is, is incorrect. Um, yeah, how do you spell it? H-O-R-R-Y. Okay, uh, is it good now? Yes, perfect, thank you. No problem. Okay, that's one, two, three. So it looks like we need two more people, right, Craig? Yes. I think we can go ahead and begin. Hello, everyone. I am Clayton Smith, Chair of the Parks and Public Spaces Committee for Community Board 5. We will hear a couple of agenda items tonight. And as I think you all know the drill, no action of this committee is the official position of Community Board 5 until our full board meeting, which is a week from Thursday night. Those meeting details, which of course, is open to the public as well, are at cb5.org. So thank you all for joining us. We, I want to welcome Karen Horry, uh, and I think um, one other person who may not be here yet is joining you, right? Uh, Cicely Harris, our chair, but I can go ahead and begin. Well, that's okay. We're actually gonna begin with, the, with Madison Square Park Conservancy tonight, which gives her a chance to join us. Uh, and I will um, hand it to you guys to talk to us about your plans for this year. Awesome. Clayton. Yes, Todd. Clayton. Okay, so uh, I'll just do a quick introduction. Great. So uh, I'm actually in a car where there's very dim lighting, but I hope everybody can hear me. So, it, so I reviewed the materials what they're doing is going to give us a very nice overview of events and the public art installation, which I believe is with, with Maya Lin. They're going to be talking about uh, the capital plan and uh, the use of the park to demonstrate uh, environmentally conscious and low carbon impact management. And they'll talk to us about uh, the activities, you know, given the situation with the pandemic, you know, I looked at it, uh, the public art installation looks very exciting. Uh, I think it should draw generally favorable comment and we'll see what else they have to say. PowerPoint presentation, I think is great. We'll make it available so everybody can see it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Robin and the Madison Square Park Conservancy. Thanks. Robin, should I just go ahead? Yep. Hi, everyone. Keats is going to be sharing tonight. Um, nice to see you all. <laughs> Thanks. So, um, hi, everyone. It's good to see you. Here we are in 2021. Um, we thought we'd start with just sort of a, a quick recap of 2020. Um, I am not going to delve into all the things we already all know about. But just to sort of tell you that um, the park, we came through this year okay. I think we, um, we feel very good about how we were able to serve the community. Um, financially, what we did to sort of survive the year um, was to make major program cuts. We moved Maya Lynn from 2020 to 2021. And we also, um, of course, cut all of our sort of what have, would have been regular programming, like some small concerts and tours and other things like that. Um, and so we cut about 25% of our, our expenses. And we also lost about 25% of our revenues. Um, but we're super thankful. The community has been really generous this year. And um, I'm grateful to the staff. I'm grateful to CB5. I'm grateful to, um, to the entire community for you know, helping us be there for, you, for everyone. Um, in terms of uh, sort of the big hits or those are the difficulties and challenges for 2020, I think there's two to highlight. Um, in terms of uh, health, we have definitely seen an increase in the rat population. We're aware of it um, and we're working to mitigate it. 
there's a couple of things contributing to it. One is with the closing of many restaurants, um, rats are looking elsewhere for their sustenance and the park is an obvious place because A, we have an re open restaurant and B, we have many garbage cans that we empty frequently, but they're there. Um, and also there's picnickers and food. Um, and the other thing that's happened this year, um, which is sort of less obvious is um, street cleaning is no longer happening um, in many areas. And that also has an impact on the rat population. We're doing our regular mitigation, which we've done. And then we've also added um, what's called carbon monoxide uh, poisoning. Um, and that is um, that will help but it also in right after you do it the rats that weren't in the den will be looking for a new home and so it will appear that there are more um that's a temporary thing and then we'll keep going every quarter and it will reduce the number that are right around the park um i think it's a citywide problem i'm not sure we're going to be able to change it significantly but we'll do our best we will fight the fight um, the other um, thing that came up was uh, safety around the park. Um, I think the area became much quieter. People had the perception that safety was um, more of an issue. In fact, in the park, statistically, we uh, had less crime and incidences than we had had in the past. But, um, but we hosted a community forum on safety. And I want to thank um, Marissa Mack for attending and Renee Kinsella. Uh, we really appreciate you both being there. Uh, we had the PD, we had Urban Pathways, we had um, the Flatiron, we hosted with the Flatiron, I should have said open with that, and um, the Flatiron bid. Um, so there were many people there. We think we had 150 attendees and I think it was um, an important conversation and certainly helped everyone understand that there really is a big level of effort to, to address safety, to help the homeless, um, and to keep the, to keep the community safe. We're going to be sending out a follow-up soon, um, and um, hopefully um, people will be able to get involved in keeping the neighborhood safe. Um, I, I do think it's interesting that um, from a numbers perspective, right, right around the park and in the park is, is still safe. I think it's important to know that. Um, we're also very proud of the fact that we put circles in the park and we made it um, a place where you could come and know that you were socially safe. Uh, you could be, you, you knew that you were eight feet, six to eight feet apart from other people. Um, and we will keep going with that and the open lawn program until it's not necessary. And hopefully that's sooner than later. Um, let's see. So with that, uh, moving to 2021, which is just another pretty picture here. Um, uh, we have, again, we've cut our budget by 25%. Um, some of that is in staff costs. Some of that, a, a good portion of that is in programming. Um, we're gonna be talking tonight about some highlights. Uh, Maya Lynn will be coming this year. We are gonna go ahead with that. And, you know, we have um, a whole range of, of plans that, that go from completely virtual to completely in the park. And, and I imagine, at least I hope, that over the course of the next 12 months, we'll go less virtual and more in-person in the park as we all are hoping for that um, from a pro programming perspective. Um, so with that, I think we're next going to hear from Tom. No, yes, from Tom um, about our Myelin project. Thanks, Keith. Hello, everyone. Uh, like Keith said, uh, Maya's project was uh, scheduled to happen uh, this past year, obviously didn't, uh, but we were lucky enough to kind of postpone it and uh, we'll be able to realize it this year. Uh, we've, I assume we, uh, this was shown last year at this time, uh, but to kind of refresh everyone's memories, uh, Maya, uh, a very prominent artist, uh, her focus uh, at this stage of her career really uh, is on climate change and bringing awareness to climate change and fighting that fight. Um, so as part of that, uh, her installation at the park will be um, 40 uh, Atlantic white cedar trees uh, from the Pine Barrens. These are trees uh, that died because of uh, 
saltwater uh, inundation um, related to uh, rising sea level and uh, stronger and more frequent storms. Uh, Atlantic white cedar, uh, which is a coastal tree, uh, cannot tolerate um, much salt water at all. Um, so as part of an ongoing uh, restoration project that's happening in the uh, Pine Barrens uh, and, uh, you know, acres of these dead uh, ghost forests that are being uh, cleared uh, to rejuvenate the, those lands, uh, we're going to bring approximately 40 of those trees to the park. Uh, they'll range in height from 20 to 35 feet. Uh, they're going to be installed on the oval lawn. Uh, this is a scaled model that uh, Maya has made. Uh, they'll be on the west side of the oval lawn. Uh, somewhat of a similar um, footprint to the uh, Leonardo Drew installation uh, for those who are familiar with it. Um, the way these are installed is uh, the same way that telephone poles are installed. We uh, dig a hole about six, seven feet down and we drop uh, the tree into that hole and we backfill around it. And uh, the strength of the earth um, keeps the um, tree plumb um, vertical. Uh, they'll be about 10 to 12 uh, feet apart. Uh, it's intended for people to be able to meander through um, to kind of interact with the piece, uh, but it'll be this ghost forest uh, contrasting with, you know, the uh, fo foliage of the park around it. Um, so we're pretty excited about it. Uh, I think it should be really spectacular. Um, in association uh, with this, we're doing uh, four different sets of uh, programming uh, to support her piece. Um, the first is four art talks that we'll be doing, and we're going to be doing this in uh, partnership with uh, Photographiska, the uh, photography museum at 22nd and Park Avenue. Um, and depending on where we are uh, with COVID and uh, safety measures. Uh, we may be doing some of those talks uh, at uh, photographic, photographic space. Uh, we're kind of uh, proceeding on parallel tracks. Uh, if uh, we don't feel as if it's safe to be uh, indoors, uh, we will either have these talks uh, in the park where we're outside and can spread out a little bit more uh, or um, potentially completely uh, virtual uh, as a webinar. Um, and the talks are scheduled for the first one is in June. And then the last three are uh, September, October, November. So it may change, I mean, the, uh, as things evolve. Um, the second uh, programming initiative will be uh, six concerts, uh, small concerts uh, that'll begin July 7th that we're uh, presenting in partnership with Carnegie Hall. Uh, so that's something we're very excited about. Um, these are gonna be uh, uh, musicians, instrumental, instrumentalists, um, and it, it's really the idea is for it to kind of be accent music um, to kind of uh, accentuate the piece, um, um, somewhat soft in the background uh, to kind of create a, a somewhat haunting experience um, in the ghost forest. Um, the third program will be a sound walk. Uh, this is going to be a... Uh, 10 to 15 minute um, recording that you uh, can pull up on your phone. There'll be QCR codes uh, on signage in and around the exhibit. Uh, and the sound walk is a, a narrated talk that presents uh, about 20 to 25 uh, sounds of either endangered or extinct animals that would have been native to the Madison Square Park um, uh, uh, neighborhood. Um, and we're doing that in conjunction with the, uh, Cornell School of Orthonology. 
Um, and then the very last uh, initiative is we are partnering, partnering with um, uh, the Natural Areas Conservancy, which is a um, nonprofit uh, that works with the Parks Department citywide, and they, uh, they work on the uh, restoration and the maintenance of uh, parkland, uh, natural and wild uh, areas, uh, wetlands, forested areas. And we will be uh, planting with them on uh, two to three separate events. Uh, we're hoping in all five boroughs um, uh, in the fall of 2021, uh, planting 1,000 trees and native shrubs uh, in forested areas, uh, many in flagship parks, uh, probably Van Cortland Park, Prospect Park. Um, so we're very excited about that as well. Uh, and just to close, the exhibition ends uh, November 14th. Uh, it opens uh, uh, May 10th. Uh, we'll begin installation in mid-March. It's about a two-week installation, and then we're going to take the month of April to uh, seed the lawn because it's a, it's a little bit of a messy installation, uh, restore the lawn over the course of April, and then it'll be ready uh, for foot traffic in early May. Any questions? How will the install affect the pedestrian pathways? And it much at all. We plan to, uh, the kind of hardest part is going to be bringing in these trees into the park. And we're going to do that uh, in a couple of successive uh, overnight operations. Uh, they'll be staged on the lawn itself. So once we have the trees in the park and on the lawn, everything will be contained to the oval lawn. So uh, we, we anticipate very uh, little uh, pathway disruption. And the, the oval on itself would be seated in April anyway. So it doesn't change that one month of closure, which we have to do or we'd have a mud pool. Um, so people, and then once, you know, we'll keep the lawns open as we did this year for the sort of everybody to be there in them. Uh, Clayton, can you hear me? Yeah, Todd, do you have a question? Yes. Yeah, so the art installation, looking at it, I hope that, uh, you know, it looks very dramatic. Those those tall trees I, I saw uh, from looking at the PowerPoint presentation. I hope that you'll have a good way of explaining what it is and who made it, because you know it'll be very dramatic. You know, people. I, I hope that there's a placard or something that'll give some background and make people think that it's not a half finished type of thing, but you know, a real abstract piece of art because it's going to be quite large, correct? Correct. Uh, we will definitely have signage uh, with all of our exhibits. We have exhibition signage with this one in particular. Uh, it'll, uh, it's also going to tie in a little bit to our um, uh, sustainability initiative, which uh, Keith is going to talk about in a little bit. Uh, so we're going to have uh, signage beyond what we typically have for our uh, our art installations. My only other question is where in the, in terms of the footprint of the park, I didn't really have a chance to look, ascertain where exactly is it going to be in the oval? Yeah. The oval lawn uh, and the west side primarily. So there's no way it's going to like lock anybody or uh, get in the way or, you know, you know, block any light or anything like that. No, people will be able to sit at the base of the tree and lean against it. They'll be able to walk among the trees. It's um, the, it's totally accessible. Great. Okay. Thanks, cool. Todd. Are there other questions for members of the committee? I'm having kind of a strange Zoom glitch where I see that there are hands, but actually we're not right now I don't, but in general, I see that there are hands raised, but I don't see who. I'm not sure what's happening. I saw a hand raised physically by Dave Akalis. Dave, Dave, you have a question? I... You, you are muted. Dave, you are muted. Sorry, sorry. Uh, one question, what, what is going to happen to the trees after the exhibit? Uh, 
our plan is they're going to uh, return to the logger uh, who's harvesting the trees for us and they'll be sent to a mill and uh, be used for uh, building material, which, you know. I asked because like, uh, cedar, cedar makes great acoustic guitars. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. Blackboard and shingles and the like. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's the plan. It's going to go back to the logger and then go to a, a sawmill. Okay, so thank Maybe exhibited once or twice before then, um, we hope. Thank we you. shall see. Um, okay, so Steph, are you going to speak to uh, Mad Square Hort? Sure, absolutely. Hi, everyone. Um, so specifically, Mad Square Hort this year is going to focus a lot on our seasonal displays that we have here in the park. Um, and the one I'm most excited for is our Pine Barrens Garden Display, which will take place between mid-May to September in conjunction um, alongside the uh, Myelin Ghost Forest piece. So um, as Tom had elaborated, the um, Pine Barrens is a particular region um, of New York and New Jersey. It's a very unique eco landscape um, of kind of coastal plains and swampland. So we'll actually be installing a lot of plants that you can find in that habitat um, around the park, specifically in our reflecting pool, um, our fountain area and around our monuments. So people can experience what the Pine Barrens actually feels like within the park itself. So we'll have um, swamp magnolias, we'll have uh, blueberries, pitch pines, hopefully we'll able to source some carnivorous plants such as sundews, which I'm really excited about. Um, and that's gonna be the highlight of our horticultural program in 2021. Um, in addition to that, we are going to do some public volunteer days in the park. We did um, two trial public volunteer days in November where all the participants were required to register in advance, um, had to take a lot of COVID precautions, um, fill out surveys, and it was pretty successful. Um, with their help, we were able to clear a lot of the leaves off our lawns so people could actually see our social distancing circles. So it was a really great success and we hope to repeat that again um, with other projects in the spring and fall of 2021. Um, as we kind of touched on, our open green program is our lawn program. So um, as we mentioned, the lawns are currently in rest right now. They're a little beat up from uh, a lot of use this year. And so um, in April, we will be reseeding the lawns. Once the lawns have been reseeded and had some time to establish, we'll be opening up the lawns on May 1st. Um, for all the public, we will continue to do the social distancing circles on the lawn as long as we need to. Um, and then lastly, we'll be bringing back some really exciting seasonal displays. So every spring, we usually have some kind of bulb display. Uh, the tulips will be returning this year, and uh, I think they'll look just as fantastic as they've ever been. So the first really excited time, for that. I just want to add, for the first time in three years, because we had gotten a, a fungus in the tulips. So when you see the tulips this spring, it's a, it's a big event for us. We're very excited. It very much is. So that's pretty much Hort programming. Um, it's really kind of passive recreation of the space with a little bit of interactive um, pre-registration volunteer days. All right, turning it over to you, Keith. Okay. Um, so um, as you all may remember in uh, about a hundred years ago, last January, um, we presented our neighborhood carbon challenge. Um, and that was a sort of three phased way of engaging the community in, in reducing the carbon footprint, our carbon footprint and the community's carbon footprint. Um, clearly the big launch, we had a lot of plans. We had big dreams. It was huge, we we're excited. And COVID just kind of put an end to that pretty quickly. Um, and so Robin led, um, and keep going, don't go there yet. Um, yeah, Robin led a strategic planning session um, among, in, in the organization and we really focused on one year. And what we ended up deciding was that it wasn't just about a neighborhood carbon challenge, it was about the ecology of the park. And so what we did is created a pillar called sustainability, Mad Square Sustainability. And now you can go to the next chart. Um, and, and what that is, is um, we will sustainably steward a healthy green space far into the future by nurturing the ecosystems that exist in the park and striving to reduce the carbon emissions that cause climate change. We will inspire communities and public green spaces to become more sustainable by sharing our experience. Um, you know, when it's all boiled down into one little sentence, it looks pretty straightforward and simple, but it took a lot of conversation to decide how we would um, focus our energies on this. And I think um, we are committing a significant portion of our budget and our energies um, to this 
to this effort. I think the fact that Maya Lin's project will be happening this year will amplify what she's doing, what, what we're doing, and I hope we will, she, she doesn't need amplification, but I think the two projects together will send a loud message about the need for us all to steward our spaces. Um, next slide. Um, ecology is about, um, it's, the, it's the interaction of, um, of systems, a thriving ecosystem. And over time, we, we have documented the impacts of climate change in the park. And um, it has shown that our eco ecosystem, our health is threatened by rising carbon emissions. And so we're committing to try to maintain or to work to maintain a healthy ecosystem and restore uh, native wildlife. And we will continue to monitor the ecological health and reduce our carbon footprint um, by engaging in sustainable practices. And so um, the Neighborhood Carbon Challenge sort of became a part of the sustainability program. And um, year one, which is this year, 2021, I can't believe it's 2021, um, we will be focusing on park and land. And I'm not going to read through the goals now, but I'm happy to speak with anybody who's interested in learning more about this. We're really excited about it. But basically, there's park and land, park and life, which focuses on transportation and energy efficiency, and park and lunch, which focuses on sort of uh, one of the huge impacts to the carbon footprint is um, what you consume in your food and, and sort of how you consume it. And um, that was a huge part of the original plan. But when all the restaurants went through the, let's call it trauma that they've been going through in the last um, nine months or whatever it is, um, that we've now put out to probably 2023. Park and Life was probably 2022 and Park and Land is now, and that's focusing on how we within the park can reduce our footprint in how we have practices, um, what our practices are and how we could share that information with other parks. Um, so this is a pretty cool little story. So Sony gave us some extra, a, a whole set of amazing uh, camera equipment camera, telescope, telescopic lenses, all that stuff. And um, Josue Vasquez is um, our park manager and he's really kind of an amazing photographer. He saw this bird coming down and realized it wasn't a bird, it was this bat. And he took a picture of it and then it flew from this branch and, next slide, sadly, but as part of nature was captured by this falcon. And Steph, I don't know, I meant to ask Josue what the kind of falcon this is, do you know? It's a Cooper's hawk. Thank you. Hmm? It's a Cooper's hawk. It's a hawk. Not, that's a kind of falcon, right? Or am I totally wrong? Uh, it's in the raptor family, so it's related okay. to falcon. That's very nice of you. Okay, so it's a hawk. It's a Cooper's hawk, um, and it has the bat there, and, and Josue took this extraordinary picture, which I just think is amazing. Um, next slide, and then there it is still kind of, I think it's still holding the bat, and there it is, our hawk. <laughs> Um, next slide. So, um, oh, that's it. So that's it on the ecology and sustainability. And um, we are eager to hear from you if you'd like to learn more. And um, we're really excited about this new kind of whole department at the Conservancy. Um, so we're launching a new website. Our new website, our old new website is now five years old, which in website time is really old. And um, we will be, uh, we're working with for office use only, which is a firm and it will, should be launching in about two to three months. And it will include the sustainability uh, pillar that we've now uh, built. What else? Tom, take it away. Okay, thank you. Um, so uh, Keats and Robin, uh, starting in 2017, 2018, I believe, uh, started a capital campaign uh, with the goal of raising $8 million. Uh, we're very happy to say, uh, as of date, uh, we're 90%, 96% of the way there, uh, having raised $7.68 million. So just over a little more than 300000 to go to get to the finish line. Uh, that $8 million will allow us to complete six projects two of which have already been done, uh, as shown here. Uh, the first is the uh, entrance at the uh, Eternal Light Monument, which we did in 2018. Um, and then uh, in 2019, and just finishing really at this time last year, uh, we completed the uh, replacement of an in-kind uh, pedestal 
um, for the William Seward Monument at 23rd and Broadway. Um, our next project uh, in the line is the dog run, um, which has been presented on a couple of occasions to the uh, community board and probably will come through one final time. Uh, we're just finishing up construction drawings. Uh, nothing has really changed uh, from the last iteration that you would have seen, but uh, we do uh, one more review with uh, this group and then uh, ultimately uh, public design commission. Uh, our intent is uh, for that work to commence uh, toward the end of this year. Uh, so fall 2021, um, we're hoping, uh, we're, we're anticipating a, a six to nine month um, construction period. Obviously we hope it's closer to uh, six months. Um, following that, uh, we'll move into the uh, repaving, uh, the replacement of the hex block, um, pavers on the south half of the park. Uh, the, the north half pavers were replaced about 10 years ago, uh, but these pavers on the south end haven't been uh, replaced uh, since uh, the park was renovated in 1999. And many of those pavers were just recycled from what was there prior to 1999. Uh, with that, we're gonna be uh, adding some uh, electrical drops through the park to kind of help us uh, with maintenance needs and programming needs. Right now, I think we have three receptacles throughout the entire park. And so any time we do anything requiring electricity, we have these kind of crazy setups with extension cords all over the place. So this will just make it much more efficient. Um, after that in 2022, um, we uh, plan to be building the trash and a storage enclosure uh, at 23rd and Madison, again, which this group has seen. Um, and then the last uh, project, not a physical project per se, is uh, a, a, a $2 million tree fund endowment um, that will, uh, moving forward, uh, will sustain uh, the tree canopy and maintenance and replacing trees uh, as trees expire. Um, and uh, I think that's it. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Sure. That is it, it. <laughs> that is it. <laughs> that is also great. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we're gonna open the floor to committee members for questions about any of the above. And I know that Mike Kaback had his hand raised. Yeah, I did. Um, and the two questions that I wanted to ask or answered, where exactly though, will those trees be uh, uh, placed, you say on the oval? Can you show me on the previous slide, the picture exactly where that is, the one from the very top? Sure, staff, do you have the ability to go back? Okay. In that, just where we're. There we go. Yeah, so uh, perspective, we're looking from uh, north to the south. Um, so uh, we're on, if you kind of uh, run an access, uh, a line right down the middle of the oval lawn, which is kind of defined by a, a line of trees we're, we're to the west of that. So we're on the Fifth Avenue side uh, in kind of the open grass area uh, of the lawn. And, and the other question had to do with the dog run. Um, I was curious, you said that you're gonna be doing that in the fall um, and it'll take um, quite some time to do. Um, is that still the plans we saw with the, with the water cascading between a big dog park and a little dog park as I recall? That's correct. Uh, we refer to it as the water rill. It's a small uh, cascade. <laughs> a small cascade, uh, about a half inch, a inch of fresh water that comes through uh, for ducks to splash in, but it's also a drinking source for the animals. It's not recycled water. Uh, it's controlled by bollards, so it's active. You know, it's we're not just running water all the time, obviously, uh, and it gets activated. You know, similar to how our spray showers work in the playground. 
it gets activated, it runs for a set period of time, and then it, it only comes back on if it's reactivated. Thank you. Sure. Other questions from members of the committee? Um, while we wait for a second to see, I did want to ask about the sustainability campaign, which is super inspiring and important work. If there's a juncture at which this year there would be an appropriate time to come back just to kind of give us an update on how that's going, if there's if it's broken down this year into kind of chapters at all or how you see it kind of being executed? Um, well, we hope to launch in April during Earth Week. Um, and then Maya's project starts in mid-May and the programming begins sort of thereafter. And all of Maya's pro pro programming um, is related to the climate issue. And so, we'll make sure you're all invited to um, all of those things. With, I'm, I'm guessing at least the first half will be virtual, but who knows? Um, and yeah, we'd be happy to come back and share um, how, it go, how it is going and how we're engaging people and for what the plan is. We're really excited about it. It's, um, we spent a year planning it and then everything got thrown up, you know, just like the whole world. Um, so, we're now in this sort of like new plan. And so, yeah, we will definitely keep you in the loop. I know we'd love that. It seems like a, an unprecedented initiative for any Park Conservancy in our district, as far as I know. So um, yeah, we're very excited yeah. to see how it goes. Yeah, we're hoping we can um, make everybody get into it. <laughs> yeah. All other parks, I should say. Uh, we had a question from Will. Hi, real quick. I'm just curious, who manages the endowment for the tree fund? Uh, JP Morgan, um, we have a, a, a so person there who manages all It's institutional. Funds. That's all I was curious about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank Definitely you. Not me. <laughs> Any other questions from members of the committee? Yes, Miriam. Nice, nice Christmas card, Miriam. Thank you. <laughs> Um, I was wondering while while you're working on the electric the electricity um, addition, is there any way to light up the sculptures in the park w while oh. while you're while you're doing that? Uh, it would be oh. great. It would be a nice addition, I think. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean because they're not lit now, because or lit. yeah, because they're right. not lit. Yeah. Uh, possibly. Just a suggestion. It's a nice suggestion. What do you think? Well, Tom, we can look into it and get back yeah, to it. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely, with the addition of these receptacles, it, it, it makes that uh, much easier to do. You know, that would it, be great. Yeah. You know, whereas yeah, now it's it it very hard to do, even when we want to. Right. Great. Terrific. Great. So thanks. Maybe you can let us know if you do any research how feasible that is. Sure. Okay. Thanks. And also, I'm assuming this means fewer generators. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and also those trip covers that you see all the time, the yellow, ugly trip covers. Gone. Yeah. Gone. Yeah. Hooray. All right. Any other questions from members of the committee? And before we move forward, I want to open it up to members of the public. If anyone has any questions for the Conservancy about any of these initiatives, uh, yes, a question from Michael Benabib. I think that Luke will momentarily. There you go. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm excited that you're doing so many great things. Um, I was wondering um, about the dog run. Will there be another area to use for that six to nine month period, a small area for people to take their dogs? Yeah. Um, what we're thinking it's, it's, it's a challenge for sure, because it will completely destroy whatever area <laughs> we choose. Um, but we're, we've decided to put into the budget a significant amount of money to restore whatever, whichever areas we choose. So we're going we're gonna to take a lawn and dedicate it to be a temporary dog run. And then it'll probably cost us about $100,000 to restore the space uh, once we're moved back to the real dog run. Wow, that, that's wonderful news. Also, um, sustainability, it's just so great what you guys are doing. I've noticed that the lampposts are on 24 hours. Is that part... 
How does that play into uh, the sustainability? Tom, do you want sure. to? Um, so, hi, Michael. Um, the, um, the park lamps uh, run on three zones uh, controlled by a light sensor. Uh, so the way it should work is they come on and off uh, at dusk and dawn. Uh, there is an override um, that um, can be had. It's kind of an egg beater type um, switch. We do turn them on occasionally when we need to uh, pull power from lampposts. Most of the lampposts have uh, what we call pull taps. Uh, so right now, because we have the lack of re receptacles in the park, if we have to find electricity, we, we plug into the base of the uh, light pole. So we have to manually turn it on. Uh, the contractor that does the bulb replacement and uh, light pole maintenance, they do the same thing when they're in the park working and they're in with some frequency. Uh, we, we do sometimes run up against the problem of they should turn off automatically when we turn them on. Uh, there, there's one that's problematic for trying to have that repaired. But usually when you see the lights on during the day, it's because we need an electrical source or the contractor needs an electrical source from uh, one of the light posts. So uh, that's wonderful news that when you uh, get these receptacles, there'll be less need for the lights to be on during the day. In the that's, southern half of the park, yeah. yes. Ah, okay. And then lastly, um, the pathway behind Shake Shack has this um, container and uh, it's closed. It, it, is that a short-term thing or is yeah. that a long-term thing? That's a, um, there are two of them and they were put up so that we could give our staff a safe space to take a break during COVID. I see. Oh, well, I'm glad you're taking care of your staff and. Thank you for taking care of the park. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. We have a question from Zul Zulkowitz. Luke, if you could give, there you go. Unmute yourself. Thank you, Clayton. Uh, not a question, but just wonderful, outstanding presentation. As a daily user of the park, an artist, a sculptor, and a longtime environmental activist, I couldn't be more thrilled about having this Maya project. I'm already inviting friends from all over to come and visit and uh, spend time when uh, to see the uh, installation and to, to be there. Just wonderful work with people. Thank you. That's so nice of you to say. Really Thank appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions from members of the committee? And while I give that a second, uh, I will move that for everyone's uh, reminder, every year we vote on the roster for programming in particular for the Conservancy and for all of our parks. It's drastically different this year, the shape of that, but it certainly still warrants us having a position. And uh, to remind everyone, we do not take a voting position on the public art pieces. Um, we simply uh, give feedback and ask questions. And similarly, the capital campaign projects come to us, since those are bigger deals, they come to us one by one separately. And as you know, we have heard them already uh, and we'll continue to hear future iterations as they develop and go before the PDC. So the proposed resolution would just be covering the programming related to the public art installation. And then I would move that we also include the sustainability campaign because that does seem like a really critical public program that we should consider part of their roster. That would be my question. It's, it's, it's Todd here. I just have one more question for the Conservancy people. Sure. Uh, if by some miracle in the best of all worlds, the vaccination process goes forward and things return to some sense of normalcy, is there any chance that we would see in the public programs in the park any return of some of the things that everybody loves so much, you know, during the summer months or the late, the late spring? Uh, maybe they could speak to that. To that. Are there any contingency plans to bring that stuff back if it becomes possible? Kate, you are muted. Super quickly, because I know you have a lot on your agenda tonight. Um, sort of yes and no. Um, 
we we have a lot of public programming plans that are related to the Maya exhibition and they are designed to be either totally virtually or totally in person or somewhere in between. The more that COVID goes away and the more we're able to do in the park, we will. Um, we used to have concerts all the time. This year it will be, we're partnering with Carnegie Hall. Um, they'll be low key, low impact because we've committed to that just aside from COVID in general. Um, so, so yeah, but I think you will see a lower key program overall. I mean, we have had to cut significantly because of uh, loss of income. And also a follow-up question to that. I assume that nothing changes as far as your contractual agreement with the parks department that even, even though we don't expect marketing events to come back with full force the first half of this year anyway, that you still are in, uh, entitled to, to have up to four marketing events. Yes, and we sure hope we get them. I hear you. <laughs> All right, well, uh, I don't see any more raised hands. So can I hear a motion? Motion to approve. And can I hear a second? Second. All right, Craig, let's take it to a vote. Yep, Clayton. Yes. Craig, yes. Dave. Yes. Miriam. Miriam, on. Yeah, yes. Yeah, yes. Thanks. Uh, Kelly. Kelly. I see Kelly Burton. You're muted, Kelly. Um, yes, I'll take it as a yes. Okay. Uh, Chris. Yes. Aaron. Yes. John. Yes. Yeah. Will. Yes. Sam. Yes. Mike. Yes. Evan. Yes. Todd. Yes. Noah. Yes. Barbara. Yes. Daniel. Yes. Passes. Great, thank you, Craig. Thank you all so much. Thanks for joining us and we look forward to seeing how everything rolls out. Happy New Year, we'll see you soon. Uh, okay, I'm sorry that I should have begun the meeting by letting anyone know who was in attendance for the item about One Pen Plaza, that that repaving item, they asked to postpone, they'll be coming back next month. So if anyone was here for that, I've kept you waiting for 48 minutes for no reason, sorry. Uh, and now, second but not least, we are thrilled to welcome CB10 Board Chair Cicely Harris, along with their Parks and Recreation Committee Chair, Karen Horry. They have a presentation uh, about the sculpture for the Exonerated Five in Central Park. And you all may recall that we spoke about this briefly in June, I believe it was the June round of meetings. Uh, but without a presentation and without lots of detail, and we didn't take a position at that time. Uh, but as a district bordering Central Park, we have the, the, I guess, right to weigh in on anything in Central Park that we deem uh, important to uh, our district or to the city at large. And I think this proposed sculpture certainly rises to that threshold. So we're excited to hear from CB10 and I'll let you all take it away. And just Thank unmute you, yourself. Hi. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Cicely Harris. I am the chair of Community Board 10. Um, thank you, Clayton. Thank you, um, Craig, Marissa, and Vicki. So good to see you all. Um, I know Karen's on, she's our chair of parks and has put so much work into this initiative, her and her committee. So we're excited to be here and present you um, our Exonerated Five a project initiative. Uh, so we've been on this kind of tour of Manhattan um, presenting our um, initiative. And really the borough president, Gail Brewer has taken it upon herself to, um, this started as our small CB10 kind of conversation. Um, but she saw it as a real chance to have a, a, a good conversation about um, social justice and what we can do as a borough, not so much Harlem, um, especially in a place like Central Park, which, you know, is a central focal point and such an important landmark 
in Manhattan and I mean, just really throughout the country. Um, so she saw it as a chance for us to really um, have a, a landmark discussion about an issue that affects all of us. So um, we have our presentation. Um, I know Karen's here. I know she wants to probably kick it off, but thank you so much for having me uh, today and us on our board. Thank you, Cicely, and I'd like to thank Community Board 5 for having us this evening. And I just it was so interesting listening to the work of the Madison Square Conservancy. Um, it's just fantastic, all of the work that you do. And I have to say thank you also. My um, sister passed in April of this year during the um, pandemic, and she is being honored with uh, tulips, 150 tulips being planted. So we're, my family's looking so much forward to attending that, and especially in view of the fact that we did not have a... Um, a physical memorial service. So um, thank you for all of the wonderful work that you do. So with that, I'd like to um, begin our presentation. And this evening, we're looking for either a letter of support or a resolution, which would be great. Um, so let me begin. I'll start by sharing my screen. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Hello? We almost. I know you've, you're sharing your screen, but we don't actually see anything on it. Oh. There you go. Yes, we see oh. it. Oh, okay. Thank you. All right. So um, uh, this exhibit is to honor the exonerated five and also the need for social justice reform. And we are uh, recommending that this um, art installation be um, installed inside of Central Park. So let me just get to our reasoning behind that. So the mission of this exhibit would be to create um, an exhibition of a permanent parks and recreation educational commemoration within Central Park, inside of Central Park to honor the exonerated five and social justice reform by April, 2022. Uh, April, 2022 would be the 20th year of the exoneration for these um, five men. Um, we also are looking at raising awareness and sensitivity to a systemic and institutionalized pattern of racial injustice and the need for reform. I'm sorry, whoops. Public art has the power over time to transform and uplift social consciousness. And we at Community Board 10 envision a city with successful and engaging public spaces where citizens and visitors alike will encounter a work of public art that is not only captiv captivating, but conscious raising as well. We envision a permanent commem commemoration to the fortitude and resiliency of the five men known as the exonerated five and to the need for social justice reform. We propose a commemorative, commemorative permanent art piece cited in the Northeast section of Central Park that celebrates the extraordinary diversity and history of our community while pointing to the city's aspirations for the future. Um, I hope everyone has had an opportunity to look at our um, resolution. This um, segment that we're coming up on um, de deals basically with the, the resolution. So I won't go into it into great detail, but the, uh, for five young boys who hail from the Harlem area adjacent to the Northern end of the park, Near 110th Street, Central Park loomed as a rural oasis in the midst of the urban concrete. Their access was limited by the algae-dominated near and dilapidate, dilapidated facilities, which was not the norm for the more affluent areas of the park. But nevertheless, these young boys viewed the park as their backyard. On April 19, 1989, these boys would experience the onset of an unimaginable blight in their young lives that no one should have to ever endure. The high profile case brought to the light the prevalence of racial profiling, discrimination, and inequality in the media and legal system. Corey Wise at 16 was tried as an adult under New York laws of the day. All were convicted despite inconsistent and inaccurate confessions, no DNA evidence, no, eye, no eyewitnesses, no eyewitness accounts, placing them at the scene of the crime or with the victim. So on December 19th, 2002, New York State Supreme Court, Justice Charles J. Tejada vacated the convictions of the once five uh, children, now men, 
Now, men, he did so based on new evidence that could have easily been explored during the initial investigation. A shocking confession from a serial rapist, Matias Reyes, and a positive DNA match to evidence, uh, to evidence finds at the crime scene substantiating Reyes's confession. And all, all of these five young men served uh, six to 13 years time in imprisonment. This um, horrific event had a, had a um, uh, horrific impact on the families. Um, the many years of stress, and this is a testimony from Mrs. Youssef, Mrs. Uh, Sharon Salam, mother of Youssef Salam, where she states that the many years of stress on our innocent boys and families caused many family members to be inflicted with disease and driven to death. In 2003, Matias Reyes stepped out of the shadows and confessed to raping the, the uh, jogger, Patricia May Trisha Maley. His DNA supported his confession. Now that the prison experience is over, we are all trying to move toward forgiveness while we are rebuilding our lives. The story of the uh, Exonerated Five continues to be told through acclaimed storytellers in print, film, and TV. Um, we have the biographical account by um, Sarah Burns, author Sarah Burns, which um, came out in 2011. Um, the film, The Central Park Five, um, directed by Ken Burns, Sarah Burns, and David McMahon in um, 2012, um, which was a um, award-winning uh, documentary. And then we have Ava DuVernay's When They See Us, which was um, aired in 2019 an award-winning production, and uh, a uh, companion special entitled Oprah Winfrey Presents When They See Us Now, featuring the cast creator and the Exonerated Five, um, which was on Netflix and OWN TV. This was, was in 2019. Why should we have a, a in part commemoration? And, um, we look at goals which we would like to achieve with this commemoration. A commemoration to the exonerated five in Central Park would be designed to shed light on the prejudice, hatred, and ultimately unnecessary incarcerations that occur due to the inequities inherent in the American justice system and has a very uh, a huge impact on Community Board 10. To inform, engage, and activate the public in building a path to healing for Black and, Lat and, and Latinx communities in Harlem, the nation, and throughout the world. And we're also looking to educate, not incarcerate. And we, need, uh, we would use this as a forum to, to uh, subvert the prison, the, I'm sorry, the school to prison pipeline, which exists and is very real. African Americans make up approximately 13% of the American population but roughly 36% of the 2.2 million Americans incarcerated. About one in nine black men between the ages of 22 and 34 years of age are in prison. New York City's communities of color are disproportionately impacted by incarceration. Youth of color remain far more likely to be uh, instituted than white youth. Between 2003 and 2013, the racial gap between black and white youth in secure commitment facilities increased by 15%. High imprisonment rates correlate with other community problems related to poverty, employment, education, and health. This inequitable disparity has been made even more evident as a result of the ravages of COVID-19. Improvements were made to the northern end of the park um, beginning in 1989 following the Central Park jogger case. Work on the ravine located in the northern part of the park was completed by 1992. The Central Park Conservancy announced a $51 million campaign for upgrades in 1993, resulting in the restoration of bridal trails, the mall, the Harlem Mirror, the North Woods, and the construction of the Dana Discovery Center at the Harlem Mirror. An in-park commemoration will present a forum to raise conscious awareness around the need for social and criminal justice reform, a, a, a gross miscarriage of justice that forever brutally altered the lives of five young boys from the community who formerly saw the north end of Central Park as their backyard. The in park commemoration would encapsulate a return to the site of origin of the miscarriage of justice in a sense coming full circle. 
This would be an added component in the promulgation of an iconic healing of systemic wounds on a much broader societal level. The park is the most natural location for a commemoration since its location is burned into the collective memories of New Yorkers as a major turning point in our city's history. Additionally, the objectives of an, of an in-park commemoration, would, in addition to honoring the resiliency and experiences of the exonerated five, bringing attention to the pervasiveness of racial injustice within the criminal justice system, with special attention to the experiences of young people of color, also changing the narrative of who was honored to, um, to embrace all corners of our city, sharing the lived experiences of people who are victimized by the criminal justice system and, de and demonstrating that this is not an isolated injustice, but part of a large system, a larger system that produces injustice in daily ways. And while this um, commemoration touches on advocacy, showing the role of the exonerated five and shifting criminal justice policy in New York State, the exonerated five were involved in pushing with the Innocence Project legislation that now requires that all interrogations be electronically recorded now and they are now working on a bill that would ban the use of police, de police deception in the interrogation room. Four key audience um, segments that the exhibit seeks to engage would be the local area residents, um, black and brown communities of the north at the northern border of the park that have been generation generationally impacted by mass incarceration and the economic and social disparities that collectively affect them, the affluent communities surrounding Central Park as well. The 42 million visitors um, that visit Central Park each year. So our objective is to co connect with the diverse local, national and international uh, general public. The media, um, helping them to acknowledge their past um, sins in connection with this case and to reimagine how they report about largely black and brown um, defendants so that they embrace the presumption of innocence in their coverage. Um, also an opportunity to work with them to rewrite the story through what we hope will be a new and different lens that respects innocence. And lastly, the youth, engaging the youth community, teaching them about the scourge of wrongful, wrongful conviction, about how racism defeats the presumption of innocence and helping them to be, become engaged in social change. Desired takeaways for visitor, visitors would include uh, a reflection on the human cost of systemic racism and explore the roles and responsibilities of individuals, society and government when confronting racism, injustice and institutionalized inequities. Also to educate the public about what led to the conviction and subsequent exoneration of the Central Park Five, including the historical context about policing in New York City at the time and the problems that are, are still ongoing today. Again, we would like the uh, media to be uh, to to understand that it that they have responsibility and accountability in, in reporting uh, information uh, to the public so that it is is, is factual and and um, and unbiased. The commemoration is envisioned as physical and permanent, um, but at this point, it is anomalous. Uh, we are looking to have an art um, selection process. As, as a result, of, I mean, as a part of the um, development of this, this project. So it could be encountered at or near a threshold into the northern end of Central Park or inside of the park itself. It should be inviting and pervade a sense of community ownership. So again, the presumption of innocence was totally disregarded and the imprisonment ordeal and subsequent family suffering should be designed to be powerful but palatable to the viewing experience. The blatant racism should be graphically exemplified, uh, including Donald Trump's full page ads in the media at the time as part of the middle section of the exhibition and generous use of color should permeate the graphics throughout. We're also looking at using technology as a part of this exhibit as well. So again, the uh, uh, primary um, purpose of this exhibit is to educate An exonerated five commemoration could be linked to uh, uh, a variety of programs or existing um, exhibits already in Central Park, uh, monuments um, that are um, currently uh, there. Um, 
with the objective of raising awareness and sensitivity to a systemic and institutionalized pattern of racial injustice and need for reform. So we currently have the Seneca Village Central Park commemoration, which is exhibit, um, which is temporary, but we are lo hope, looking to have it made permanent. That is our objective. Um, and this, um, the Seneca Village project uh, dealt with um, social injustice. Uh, it was a, um, a, uh, a thriving African-American village, which was uh, raised um, and people were displaced to make way for Central Park. The, the um, village existed from 1825 to 1857. Um, the Women's Suffrage Monument um, can be tied in. Ida B. Wells, who was a um, anti-lynching um, advocate uh, at, at the uh, around the time of the uh, turn of the century, um, was um, very much involved with the lynchings that were going on. Lynchings were being um, done in the thousands um, uh, at that time. And um, it was just, um, just, just, just a horrific time. Um, but she uh, was a part of this women's suffrage uh, movement. Marion J. Sims, um, a uh, um, practicing, well, he, he was a, um, a physician who practiced and, and used um, uh, women who were enslaved as um, ex as experimental. Um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm getting a little emotional right now, but um, he performed uh, gynecological procedures on um, enslaved women who uh, without anesthesia, and then later on would practice on white women, but but with the use of anesthesia. So that was the medical apartheid that um, exi existed, which is a, a, um, um, a, a an affront to social justice. Um, also, there is um, uh, we could tie in with the New York Historical Society. They have an ongoing exhibit um, for Seneca Village and also on the history of slavery in, in, in New York City. And then there's the Rikers Public Memory Project. Um, Rikers Island was a uh, penal colony going back to um, this, uh, I believe the 1600s. And um, so there's a whole history of, of, uh, of, in, of, of um, social injustice that took place on that island. Um, the slavery, uh, slavery ended in New York in 1827 in the state of New York. New York City purchased the island in 1884. The Rikers Island Jail opened in 1932 and has been notorious for overcrowding, violence, abuse, substandard and inhumane conditions. Um, uh, and the Rikers Public Memory Project is advocating for its closure. Corey Wise, who um, is one of the exonerated five, uh, spent time there and uh, had an experience uh, uh, un un untold brutality. So we have um, advocates in the community um, who are supporting us. We also have um, uh, elected officials. We have uh, a wonderful support, excellent support from our borough president, Gail Brewer. And um, I can share with you um, all of the letters of support that we have gotten thus far from elected officials. So, um, this exhibit, which is advocating for social justice reform, would um, would also help us in, in advocating for legislature ending unnecessary jail detention for people awaiting trial and for low level offenses, shortening excessive prison sentences and improving release processes, sentencing fewer people to incarceration and making sentences shorter, changing the financial incentives that fuel punitive justice system responses, stopping probation and par parole systems from fueling incarceration and keeping juvenile justice criminal justice and immig immigration processes separate. We're also looking to, looking to give all communities a voice in how our justice system works and an examination of punishment versus rehabilitation. As a part of our planning methodology, Community Board 10 uh, really went to great lengths to vet this issue. It was first voiced at our general board meeting in October of uh, uh, 2000 and 19, and um, we took it up in, in, in the Parks and Recreation Committee. Um, as a part of our um, outreach, we held three public panel discussions during the summer, um, and the, our panelists included Sarah Burns, the filmmaker and uh, 
director of the Central Park Five documentary, uh, Malik Yoba, author and activist, Dr. Youssef Salam, a member of the Exonerated Five, Mrs. Sharon Salam, co-founder, uh, mother of Youssef Salam, and co-founder of the Exonerated, um, I'm sorry, the, the uh, Justice for the Wrongfully Incarcerated. Jay Larry, a corporate attorney, Ricardo Barreto, uh, an independent cultural community consultant specializing in public art process. Cynthia Copeland, president of the Institute for the Exploration of Seneca Village History. Vincent Sutherland, executive director, NYU Center on Race, Inequality and the Law. Um, we also had Rebecca Brown, director of, pos of policy of, uh, with the Innocence Project. Dr. Adamola Alubafola, um, Vice President in, of International Communications Association and the Harlem Dwyer Cultural Center. Brenda Berkman, Director of the Monumental Women Board of Directors, myself, can't worry, and Isaiah Jenkins, Manhattan Borough Director for the Office of Mayor Bill de Blasio. So this is an overview of, of uh, our um, uh, vetting of this issue. Um, and as I said, it was first voiced at an October meeting in 2019 at our general board meeting, uh, which took place. Um, then uh, we voted to, uh, the executive committee voted unanimously to authorize the formation of a, um, of, of this um, park commemoration on March 25th. Um, that, and I believe that's when we authorized the formation of a subcommittee to, to, um, to, con to, to, to continue to work with this issue, to, to, um, to do the vetting. Um, we, the Parks and Recreation Committee uh, dealt with this issue on December, at our December meeting, January, December of 2019, January of 2020, February of 2020, March 11th of, of 2020, April of 2020, and May of 2020. Um, and as, as I said, a, a subcommittee was formed on March the 25th. Um, then the subcommittee met on June, in June of 2020, July 9th and July 30th of 2020. Um, on June 3rd of 2020, the community board unanimously passed a re resolution in support of the installation of a permanent commemoration of the exonerated five and social justice reform to be located in New York City Central Park. Um, we also reached out to the different agencies to find out what the procedure would be to have the, insta to, to have, uh, the installation implemented. Then, we, as I said, we had the focus groups, which were held over the summer. Um, these public, dis uh, pub public discourse, um, and this was um, these were held on uh, July 9th, July 16th, and July 23rd of 2020. Uh, the subcommittee developed a walkthrough group to uh, explore the possibilities for a location for the-, for uh, the Are you there, Karen? Yes, yes. So this would be, so uh, they went out on two occasions, uh, August in 13th and 15th, and they had established criteria. The criteria um, consists of uh, that the um, location involved the route that people would have entered the park in 1989. Um, that it be accessible for park visitors and that the site be Sorry, this is Clayton. My internet dropped out, but I'm back, although I can't hear anything. Uh, it's dropped out. out. Yeah, I can't hear her either. I can't hear Karen either. She's still connected because the presentation is still up. Maybe Cicely, do you want to? Maybe unstable or something like that. D. I will, I'm going to um, reach out. I see her. Let me see. Oh.
maybe she's Can reaching out to her. Because it's only it's like maybe three more slides and it's over. Let me see. Well, while it's a wonderful presentation. Yes, while we are while we are waiting to see if we can get her back, we we can certainly uh, go ahead and begin speaking as a committee. Uh, unfortunately, we can't quite all see each other because Karen's sharing her screen, and I don't think we can override that. Okay. Oh yes, actually we can. Hmm. It said that I could, and now it's not doing it. If you move the, if you make the her screen smaller, uh, I can see everybody now. Yeah, everyone can just drag the vertical bar over in between all of our faces and the shared screen. So uh, while we wait to see if if Karen is joining us again, and Cicely's on the phone, so she's not probably can't hear me, but I want to thank them so much for a truly. Oh wait, Karen's back, Cicely. Uh, I want to thank you for a impressive, a comprehensive, thought-provoking and moving presentation for a really, really fascinating and, and uh, important proposal. I just want to say a few words framing the discussion that we can have and also what our role is in this process. So procedurally for the benefit of, of the committee members and the members of the public listening. CB10 is the lead district rep on this proposal. So accordingly, we we can hear you, Clayton. Now, I am not muted. Now you now we hear you now. My God, maybe there's some kind of gremlin in the Zoom. I was not muted. That's strange. Uh, but you were hearing me for a while there, right? Okay, so what we are not doing tonight is diving back into the details of this proposal. We are not rehearing this item as an original proposal. What we are doing tonight is hearing our position of support for a proposal being put forth by CB10 as the, as the lead on this issue. And I would expect that other community boards would do the same and ultimately that could lead to a borough board resolution. What that means for us, just to be clear with everyone, is that while I'm happy to, to allow for people to have questions uh, for Cicely and Karen about the proposal, this is not about us saying, yeah, but I think this and I think that and we want it to be at this location instead and yeah, yeah, yeah. that's not our job in this in this, at this stage of this proposal, they clearly have vetted and had loads and loads of public input and uh, et cetera. So just so everyone's understanding that we're not hammering out details like that. This is just about lending our support to an existing proposal. The other reason is because as you know, we do not weigh in on public art installations in so far as their details, their aesthetic criteria, et cetera, we never have. Uh, and there's many reasons for that. Uh, most of all, we don't wanna be here for two and a half hours disagreeing about you know, shades of red or something. So, um, so everyone understands the expectation of the conversation. I would love to to see what uh, questions members of the committee have for Karen and Cicely. Yes, Dave. Um, it's it's an amazing proposal. You've done a wonderful job. I'm just curious though that the Central Park has a tradition of never doing a memorial or a statue or a tribute to any living person. How did uh, that affect your ability to work with Central Park? Can't hear Karen, you. you're muted. Karen, unmute yourself, please. Thanks. I'm sorry. There, there have go. been family members who have uh, who have um, have been lost as a result of of, of, of the impact from the um, from the, the whole experience of the uh, exoner exonerated five. So um, the, the, the Central Park is is coming back to us with any issues or concerns that they have. Other questions from members of the committee. Can anybody hear me? Yes, Todd. Hello. 
Yes, Todd, we can hear you. So, uh, so that was a wonderful presentation. And I'm glad to see that the city and the park and the other community boards are trying to rectify this grave injustice. The only, and, and certainly I, I hope that our community board can be supportive in every way. I would only, com my only comment is as we craft a resolution and uh, I know that, you know, I've, I've been on top of this issue for many years and I'm always interested in how our conservative neighbors, people on the other side of the opinion divide, you know, respond to something like this in looking at the materials, you know, it's a lot of it is from the liberal and progressive side of the opinion spectrum. I just hope that when the exhibit and all of the materials are put together, there, there can be some kind of effort to find people on the conservative side of the spectrum that will go along with this and, and make clear that this is, the injustice is something that's shocking to the whole community. You know, in New York City, you know, sometimes that, that gets lost in, in the rush to do this. So I guess uh, I'm just wondering, you know, ha has there been any pushback on the way this has been presented or framed? Uh, and, you know, what efforts are being made to make sure that the, that the approach and the context, if the, the, there was some discussion about the context of what's happened, you know, makes it clear that the sort of propaganda and, 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 and misinformation that surrounded this that, that should be shocking to, you know, every aspect of opinion is addressed. Karen or Cicely, if either one of you want to respond, although Todd, I will just get in to say that this, you know, there is no opinion really involved in anything that was presented. I mean, there were just facts. These were just people that were wrongfully imprisoned. I'd just like to say that um, we have gotten um, a, um, a, a astounding support from uh, all of the the um, community boards that we've been through been to and we have support of uh, of several of the electric elected officials um, uh, uh, um, Senator Schumer we're getting a letter from him um, uh, we have from Congressman Espayat, um, uh, Councilman per our, uh, Councilman Perkins um, uh, I, I have a, a, an extensive list, our Senator um, Brian Benjamin, um, and we are still uh, awaiting letters of support from other elected officials, but we do have from the surrounding boards. Thank you. Other, other questions from members of the committee? Hi, this is Daniel. Yes, Daniel, go ahead. Thank you, um, and thank you for the presentation. Just really quickly, and apologies if I missed this, um, is there a proposed design uh, for the memorial or, or a rendering of one? No, not at this point. The uh, exhibit is anom anomalous. We are uh, looking to have a, a, a art selection process um, mm -hmm. as a part of the um, development. Perfect, no, that's we what did, I We did talk about, we, we talked about ideas, but, um, there are no renderings at this point um, that, that would result from the um, public art process. Awesome, absolutely. I, I, that's what I thought. I just wanted to make sure I didn't miss it. If not, thank you again. You're welcome. Other questions? I'd also like to see if any members of the public in attendance have any questions for the CB10 representatives. If you do use the raise hand feature And while we're giving that a second, what can you share with us about what you hope as far as timeline with next steps? Uh, well, we're waiting to hear back from Central Park Conservancy now that the holidays are over and, and, and New York City parks. Um, we should be hearing from them shortly. And once we um, get, uh, have, get that feedback, we will know, have a better idea of what next steps are. So um, uh, at this point, we're just waiting for that. Um, 
but uh, we went through all of the steps that you saw earlier on and, um, and we got to the point of developing a statement of, of objectives and goals. And, um, and just now we're just waiting to, to uh, get that feedback so we can move forward. Thank you. Oh, I've have... asked you a question. Yes, yes, certainly. We do have a question from member of the public. Uh, Zul, you are permitted to talk, just unmute yourself. Thank you, Clayton. I just want to say this was another extraordinary presentation. And this is such a good use of our public spaces, of our parks, to, um, to right an injustice that has lingered so long and still pervades our country. This is such a great thing you know, for New Yorkers, but for people everywhere to come to New York and to understand that there have been injustices here, that we're aware of them, and that we're going to make them right. And this is a great use of public space. Thank you so much. Any other questions uh, from members of the public or from the committee? While we're giving that a second, I wanna just go ahead and thank you again for a extremely comprehensive, very, very thoughtful uh, proposal and presentation. And I, yes. Um, is there a way that we can get copies of the presentation? Is it on the website? That would be, if you don't mind sharing that presentation, is that is that in a form that you can share at this point? It's in a it's a huge file, and um, we can we can send you excerpts. And I think I did send excerpts um, to Marissa um, earlier, but um, we have to work on how to get that. Oh, sure. Anything, yeah, anything that uh, that you can send over uh, that we would love to share it. That would be great. Thank you. You're welcome. And. I, I don't see any other raised hands, so um, I'd love to hear a motion. I do believe that, that this warrants passing a resolution. I mean, it's not my place to pontificate on this, but uh, you know, we can't, we can never right wrongs. But I believe that you've done an incredible job to spearhead an initiative to do anything that can be done to keep furthering the public conversation and to try to effectuate some kind of healing for people in, in your district and, and citywide and, and indeed all over the world who, who've watched this thing from the beginning. So oh, I think- And I would also add, I mean, I think the educational component of the presentation and, and the future, um, uh, you know, whatever it evolves into is really, is really quite critical and, and very important. Yes, thank you. I'd just like to add that Sarah Burns, who worked with us, who, who was one of the panelists, has agreed to work with us on developing a curriculum around, an educational curriculum around this, and also uh, bringing in uh, PBS as well. That's wonderful. Motion to approve. All right, can I hear a second? Second. Okay, let's take it to a vote. Uh, Clayton. Yes. Craig, yes. Dave. Yes. Miriam. Yes. Kelly. Yes. Good to hear your voice this time. <laughs> Chris. Yes. Aaron. Yes. John. Yes. Will. Yes. Sam. Yes. Mike. Yes. Evan. Yes. Todd. Yes. Noah. Yes. Barbara. Yes. Daniel. Yes. What passes. Great, thank you so much. Thank you, Cicely and Karen, for your time and for your very thoughtful presentation. And we look forward to being in touch with next steps. Thank you. Thank you so yeah. much. And happy new year to everyone. I hope this is gonna be happy a, a new year. 2021. Thank you, yes, we agree. <laughs> and that is our meeting. We are adjourned. Thank you, everyone, and we will see you soon. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you, good night.